Greetings, in no user ID. Welcome to Simeodyne USA's Virtual Message Assistant, for user. Project Director. Men pursue evil, it is evil that they will find. Mark my words. They come from the pursuit of darkness. He said, quote, Our adversary, the devil, goes about like the impact was so powerful and violent that the rogue planet was blown. <laughs> Tremble before the beast. You should make it easier on yourself and accept what it is that he bestows upon you. How many things do you think of in a day? One? Two? Hell, maybe you think of three things. What do you want, a f***ing medal? It's happened to me from time to time, and though I call it anxiety, most people call it thinking. Though rare, it's an important process of our brain's might. What if that wet noodle inside your dome had the power to manifest your thoughts into our reality? And now what if you were thinking of something really spooky, like this? That very question is what today's analog horror is all about. Greylock is a series created by YouTuber Rob Gavigan and has 12 parts in its running. That's, that's, uh, that's one less than the spooky number, so, so watch out. And I'm not f***ing around neither. We're going through all 12 videos today. So make sure you slap that subscribe button or maybe don't be so violent. Give him a little smooch. Give him a love. Give him a little love. Primary systems online. Meeting sequence complete. Back Online opens with the view inside an abandoned Simeodyne facility, as someone has entered the building to extract data from one of their archive systems. Welcome to Simeodyne USA Enhanced Access Operations. Please enter your clearance credentials. Error. These credentials are not recognized. Clearance credential requirement overridden. Administrator privileges granted. Welcome back, I'm on user ID. What would you like to do? Accessing archival storage form, GBF. Data extraction initiated. Data extraction, 10% complete. Data extraction complete. All data extracted to error no who broke in? What's Simeodyne? And will I always be this short? These are questions we do not yet have answers to, but stick with me and we may just be able to figure a couple out. I'm hoping it's the height one. I will say that I think everything we get to see in this series comes directly from the data extraction in tape one, which would explain a few things because a lot of this stuff is stuff we shouldn't be seeing. And you're gonna know exactly what I mean in a minute. shows someone going on a night drive through the winding roads of Massachusetts, heading towards, what else? A mountain! Our adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. On our way, we hear a sermon on the radio quoting Matthew 13, telling us to avoid temptation and to not enter the thicket in search of the lion, as we may pay dearly. I don't think he's talking about a literal lion. I think it's I think it's more of a metaphorical lion. I think I think what's going on here is it's it's a little uh I doubt there's a real lion on that mountain is what I'm saying. Once the driver pulls up to the foot of the mountain, we see some abandoned construction vehicles parked nearby and a security gate that of course our driver ignores. Headed higher up the mountain, recording his journey through the woods, suddenly our tape begins to glitch, showing us something gnarly happened here. The 
The audio from the sermon sneaks back in, telling us that presumably, a pair of hikers wandered up here, finding what they thought to be the mangled corpse of an animal. <laughs> camera person trains the lens onto a nearby tree as we see a strange object behind it, though what it is is unclear at this time. And apparently, our cameraman is just as confused as us when he leaves, as we see him drive his car like he's never touched one before. himself, whether we intended to or not, dear believer, we are drawn to him by our own hearts. In Matthew chapter 15 verse 19, it says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. There is a shadow nested deep, deep within our hearts, within our minds, in a place most people don't even know exists within themselves. The devil is going to call to those depths, dear believer. And though you may tremble before the beast, you should make it easier on yourself and accept what it is that he bestows upon you. I think that someone, or something, didn't appreciate our cameraman poking around Mount Greylock. analog horror without a without a training tape with some steaming pile of lore on the other side waiting for us so that's what this is immediately we learn this tape is meant for alexander marsh so if that's not your name click off the video immediately i will call the police unless you're subscribed if, you, if, if you're subscribed then stick around I, I like you guys the tape is labeled tf1 and was manufactured in 1993 by Unit 13, and is apparently property of the United States Army. Yes. And was created in partnership with Simudine USA, the guys who ran the facility back in Tape 1. We learn about thought forms, or tulpas, which are beings that with great concentration can be manifested just by thinking real hard about them. A thought form is the manifestation of a person's will, emotion, or other deeply psychologically energized state into a semi-physical form, existing as not only an extension of the person, but as its own independent and sentient entity. Thought forms are also able to be witnessed and experienced by third parties, and are not limited solely to the person who developed them. Thought forms have been formed to serve as familiars, companions, or even friends to those who conjure them. According to key literature, thought forms can be intentionally formed by a single person or multiple people, though they can be unintentionally formed as well. But they are always manifested through the deep will and focus of a person in a considerably heightened state of connectivity with their own consciousness. Traditional thought forms can vary widely in their level of influence in the real world. While they usually take physical formations eventually, their earliest stages are more apparitional in nature, with brief manifestations, though most often remaining as an unseen essence, much like a phantom or a ghost. We learn that early on, thought forms appear like a phantom, or a ghost, and can move objects, manipulate electronics, or speak through short phrases, but with enough thought, can become much more tangible, and enter our world much more permanently. It's even theorized that what we believe to be ghosts aren't spirits left behind by the recently deceased, but instead are thought forms conjured into our world by the grieving process. 
thinking so much and so hard during a state of emotional distress that they actually manifest a thought form of their loved one. Yes. We learn that a Dr. Bernard Hayes leads Unit 13's efforts in harnessing the power of subconscious thought, and has even created a big-ass machine designed to help manifest thought forms into the real world much more efficiently, where they will be kept in a chamber on site at Unit 13's facility. But don't worry, they can't harm us. I'll give you one guess as to what this video is about. We see the POV of some creep documenting himself breaking and entering into a home through a window in the back. He quietly enters the home, and... The assailant then calmly walks into the night, looking longingly at the moon, after doing whatever it is he did in there. I'd like to thank my producer, producer my writers, 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 my director, director. My friends, and you, the ordinary PP people who made me what I am today. Next Headroom premieres after Moonlighting tomorrow. They did love me. We interrupt our current program at the request of the Massachusetts State Police. This is the emergency broadcast system. This is not a test. All normal broadcasting has been discontinued during the emergency. This station will broadcast official information, news, and instruction for Northern Berkshire County, Massachusetts, after the following tone. Someone listening to the alert looks out their window, being met with the screams of both their neighbors being attacked and the attackers themselves.
I don't have any jokes there. That's, I don't, that sucks. Well, hello again, Tiffany. Oh, hi, Wanda. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. No we hear the voice of an expecting mother-to-be by the name of Tiffany Crisaldi getting a routine checkup. But suddenly... There he is. He's definitely a growing boy, that's for sure. And you're both looking really good. Oh, I love hearing that. Let's get some measurements to see exactly, exactly how much he's grown. seen that before. Maybe something to do with the power. Oh. Okay. Um, this is a bit strange. What? What's strange? Nothing to worry about or anything. Just having some trouble finding the baby all of a sudden. Maybe the machine messed up? Possibly. But I can still see everything else. It's just not picking up the baby for some reason. H have this ever happened before? Um, well, sometimes babies can move into certain positions that are hard to see. But, but, but you can't see my baby at all? I'm looking. Don't worry, he, he's definitely here. You know what? Why don't we just see if we can borrow another machine, okay? There has to be something wrong with this one. I'll be right back. Um... What are you talking about? No, 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 After her baby gets sent to the back wombs, shout out to shout out to this commenter here during our Greylock live stream. They they came up with that gem. Thank you, Star Fury. We are shown a news article stating that the young mother passed away due to heartbreak after the sudden loss of her baby boy. Woof. But if we rewind to the moment it happened, we see another news article. This time about the recent home intruder attacks. We also see this fella. Hello? Tape 6 opens with someone we heard about all the way back in Tape 3. Dr. Bernard Hayes, who if we remember, is the go-to guy when it comes to spooky mind science. He stands in front of a room full of smart people giving a lecture. To achieve one singular goal. Countless men withered away and dying in the sea leaving their towers of work behind to be climbed over by coming generations. Higher and higher they ascend, so that we were at last reached the one called God. And there, on his apex of infinite knowledge and power, we will approach and look him in the eye. Okay, Bernie. What a real fucking mad scientist thing to say. Okay. Welcome to Simeodyne USA's virtual message assistant for user Project Director Frank Porter. Next, we hear a Simeodyne system welcome Frank Porter to his answering machine. Though I think this is the same person we saw hack in during tape one. We hear a series of messages to Frank from Paul Morelli, owner and foreman of the Morelli Construction and Mining Company, taking place in 1987. Beginning playback of your messages. Message one. March 24th, 11.14 a.m. Hey Frank, it's Paul Morelli. 
We ran into somewhat of an issue today. We came across these tunnels inside the mountain, pretty deep in. But, uh, well, this is going to sound a little crazy, but he told me to call if anything strange came up, and uh, I figured this qualifies. People have been here before. Some obviously man-made shit in there, like carvings and stone. This shit looks ancient, like real old. I took a crew in to look through it, but since part of the tunnels caved in some time ago, we're going to just have to bust through it regardless. But I still wanted to make you aware of it. Anyways, I'll keep you moving. Thanks. We learned that Paul and his crew were hired to clear a path through the mountain to make way for a Simeodyne project. But before they got too far into the dig, they found tunnels had already been made inside the mountain. And apparently, they looked old as fuck. Probably... Probably about as old as your mama. Message 2. March 25th, 7.38 a.m. Hey Frank, it's Paul. Just calling to tell you the day might be a bit slower than usual. The next day, Paul tells Frank that a section of the tunnel that caved in when they discovered it had already been cleared out and lights were installed inside as well. Which is all fine and good. Uh, you know, a bigger issue might be the crew reporting they see a creature lurking around the dig site. But a few of the guys said they'd seen something running around in the woods surrounding the site. I figured it's probably a deer or whatever, but seeing all the ruckus we're making out here, you know? But they all insisted it was something else. Something like a, a real tall man. Might just be some environmentalist moron trying to cause some shit, but, you know, he ain't done nothing, so I told him to keep focused on the project. For safety's sake, we're going to avoid the tunnel until I hear back from you. All right, bye now. Later that day, Frank sends an archaeologist to the mountain to check out these apparently ancient tunnels. But after a while, the guy got the willies and fled. Which, to me, sounds like the right move. Because the next day, Paul reports that most of his crew are getting sick. And apparently, that thing in the woods is still stalking the site. I saw that thing the guys have been talking about last night, stalking around in the tree line. I swear it had a face. Anyways, just, just call me back as soon as you can, Frank. One of the crew installs a hunting camera to hopefully catch a glimpse of whatever's out there. Though, all they catch is a little cloud of smoke. Is it just me, or does that thing kind of look like, uh, like one of those ghost videos? It's probably, probably not a, like a real ghost though. It's probably like a, probably like a thought form. Probably like a thought form. Message 8, March 29th, 10.13 p.m. <laughs> Frank, it's Paul. Holy shit, uh... Well, a lot of the crew here is sick now, and they're sort of like and unresponsive. We tried emergency contacts for them, but they're now they just keep ringing. The phones, they just, they just kept ringing and ringing and ringing. Nobody picked up from any number we tried. Nobody picked up. No answer machines either. We had to call the hospital, and same thing. Just ringing. Just tried 911, still nothing. I figured the phones were fucked up, but... <laughs> I think I caught whatever's going around. My skin, it feels, feels tight. A lot of pressure behind my eyes. My, my teeth feel like they're, they're humming, vibrating. You know what? I just all started when we came across that tunnel. I feel like it, I need to figure out what's down there. And down that tunnel, Polly goes. Message 9. March 30th, time unavailable.
chapstick ought to clear that right up, Paul. So, lather up and uh, call me in the morning. <laughs> Before the tape ends, we see the hunting camera one last time. And this time, we see a familiar face. It looks like the same one that flashed on screen back in tape 5. Hello again. Authorities continue to investigate the recent crime wave that swept across northern Berkshire County, with many of its residents in a state of anxiety and panic. It was two weeks ago when the emergency broadcast system was engaged to warn residents to secure their homes due to the activity of a group of individuals who had been targeting and breaking into people's homes. We see the resulting news broadcast following the attacks in Berkshire County. The news anchor, by the name of Don Wright, tries to put the city's mind at ease, saying that the suspects have already been apprehended, and he claims that they belonged to a violent militia group. But not to worry! The cops dealt with it. We're good. Nothing to worry about at all. Why aren't you interrupting me yet? Back to normal for residents of Berkshire County. We see a photo flash on screen showing us the mother of the vanishing baby, Tiffany Crisaldi, and her husband, Alex Marsh, the intended viewer of Tape 3. We also see a blurb in a news article introducing us to a private investigator by the name of Jim Melgren. You'll note here in the article, he speaks about terrifying reports of healthy grown adults becoming deformed, growing extra limbs, and teeth growing out of their, uh, grown out of their heads, which is a bit of a bummer in my opinion. <laughs> Tape 8 immediately follows the aftermath of Don Wright's hacked news broadcast, where three producers discuss the hijack. Well, we've been trying to reach him. We've called him multiple times. We've tried his pager. We've asked around to see if anyone's heard from him, but nothing. Right now we've got Gerald standing in for him tonight if Don doesn't show. Liam Hollander reveals that Don hasn't showed up to work today and isn't answering his phone. I'm sure he's fine. Then go to his fucking house! I don't care if you kick down his front door and drag him here by his ear! You bring him into the studio! Do you understand? Yes, Mr. Rosenbaum. Of course, I'll do that right now. There's some real powerful people depending on us right now. They need us to manage the response to these events, to let the public know what's going on, and the last thing we need is it going wider than it already fucking has. So do what you need to do, or I'm going to replace you with some producers who actually know how to produce a fucking show! Sorry, the file you are trying to access has been destroyed and can no longer be executed or retrieved. Please choose another file. Sorry, sorry. Then, our hacker from Tape 1 tries accessing a file that was deliberately deleted off of Simudine's systems. Said deleted file is the personal log of Arnold Eugene Rivers, the archaeologist who was sent to the mountain back in tape six. My name is Arnold Eugene Rivers. The date is April 8th, 1987, about a quarter past nine at night. I was involved in the Morelli construction project at Mount Greylock. I was hired due to my background in anthropology and archaeology. I've worked to excavate a number of different historical sites. Paul Morelli took me on after securing a government contract for the Greylock Project. I'm recording this because I believe my life is in danger. Arnold reveals that said tunnels have been there since roughly 11,000 BCE. That's almost as old as your mama! On March 25th, Paul cleared the interior of the mountain and asked me, accompanied by a small crew, to look through the tunnels and record notes on what I was able to recognize. I was then to report to one of the project directors, named Frank Porter, to offer my perspective on our findings. I kept this to myself at the time, 
But what we discovered in that mountain was not normal. Not only did I see the impact it was having on the crew, but certain aspects of my findings did not make any sense. Many of the artifacts were pre-colonial. Some were from Native American tribes, but there were other artifacts. Some Mesoamerican and others were shockingly Clovis in nature. Finding Clovis artifacts here means that people have been coming to Mount Greylock since at least 11,000 BCE. The tunnels all connected to a series of chambers deep into the interior of the mountain. That's where the majority of the relics were found. There were old baskets of herbs and spices, pottery, weapons and armor, talismans, and other religious items, countless other things, but all of it was there purposely as offerings. <laughs> Billions of years ago, when our planet was still mostly fire and rock, that a Mars-sized planet Briefly, had been Briefly, we learned that billions of years ago, a planet collided directly with Earth, and upon its impact, it exploded into countless pieces of debris. Said debris formed what we know today as the Moon. But some pieces were left behind, deep in the Earth's crust. Maybe this is the event that set the stage that uh, introduced our world to a bunch of, bunch of f***ed up f***s running around. Adams Police Department, Dispatcher Carey speaking. Um, yes, I'm calling to report a break-in at my co-worker's house. What is your name, sir? My name is Liam Hollander. We cut away to hear the 911 call Liam Hollander placed after finding his co-worker Don Wright dead in his home. Parker, Parker Hill Road in Adams, uh, number 491. Can you tell me, is anybody hurt? Liam, are you still with me? I guess you could say that uh, things aren't going to Don Wright for old Don Wright. Or, or you could say that things have Don wrong. Back to Arnold, he shares that when he looked upon the carvings inside the mountain, he felt compelled to go deeper inside and meet with whatever potential entity eons of cultures have made sacrifices to. But he managed to resist the urge and flee to safety. I couldn't recognize a single familiar symbol, and it, it made me sick to even look at them. Let me be clear, I am not, nor have I ever been, a religious man. There's something in that mountain. S something people of countless cultures over the history of our planet have been worshipping. But I don't know why. But I could feel it. Whatever's down there, I could feel it. I informed Mr. Porter in my report that the archaeological findings in the mountain are of monumental historical importance. And that there is certainly more to be discovered. And I recommended discontinuing construction there. But it's not as though I have any authority over this project. I fully expect it to be ignored. Mr. Poor called me on the evening of March 28th, and we spoke on the phone briefly. It was as I thought. He disregarded my concerns. I informed him that I wasn't going to return to the site. He was so spooked, in fact, that he called Frank Porter and quit his job on the spot. And you would too if you saw what happened to the Morelli crew. Now loading. Morali Greylock event. Group C. Survivor data. Profile for patient B3590. Rockford, Thomas. Al formations. Notes. Communicative. Patient prone to spontaneous violent outbursts. Treatment of heavy sedation recommended. Only communicate while patient is restrained or via intercom. Now loading. Profile for patient. B9231. Washington, Samuel. Al formations. Notes. Communicative. 
Patient suffers from constant state of severe paranoia and delusions, resulting in unpredictable violent outbursts. Standard treatment ineffective. High dose xylazine is recommended. Only communicate while patient is restrained or via intercom. Now, we learn that at least seven of the excavation crew became wildly mutated beyond comprehension, and all became unruly little dudes of terror, killing and sometimes eating anything in sight. Wait, eating? Notes. Uncommunicative. Warning. Patient will attack on sight. Do not interact. Immunity to pain. Patient exhibits cannibalistic tendencies. All treatments ineffective. Immediate euthanasia recommended. Now loading. Profile for patient. B4041. Oakhurst, Scott. Now formations. Notes. Communicative. Communicate with caution. Warning, patient actively pretends to be benevolent and friendly. Strong homicidal and cannibalistic tendencies. Killed and partially consumed six staff members on April 6, 87. Patient laughed hysterically during the attack. All treatments ineffective. Immediate euthanasia or permanent restraint for further study recommended. In the words of the stupendium, I think it's time to do a little theorizing. So why not do a little theorizing? I think we just discovered the previously unnamed assailants who broke into countless homes throughout Berkshire County. Think about it. After crawling out of the mouth of Mount Greylock, these crazed lunatics traveled to the nearby towns and started freaking the fuck out down there, killing anyone in sight. Hell, we even saw that gloved hand thrust under the window in tape 4. Definitely could be the hand of a miner. Glove of a miner. Glove of a, uh, someone who mines. Someone, uh... Finally, we cut back to Arnold as he spills his guts about the whole thing. It sounds like after Frank Porter reluctantly accepted his resignation, Arnold found his front door had been unlocked. Would the government really send someone to kill me over this? I feel like I'm paranoid. Like I've lost some of my mind. But I came home from the grocery store the other day and my front door was unlocked. And I know I had locked it before I left. I scanned my entire house for traces of anything, but found nothing out of the ordinary. I even checked and replaced all of the light bulbs. <laughs> but he couldn't find any signs of surveillance. At least none that he could see. He also reveals that he went and yapped to a private investigator about the situation, but now fears for his safety. Which he should, because as he continues to talk about the mountain, we hear something walk his way out of Mr. Rivers' basement. Honestly, I feel much better just talking about it. <gasps> this can't be. Oh my god, that's a basement door. No, 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 no. Camcorder. Oh, where's the damn camcorder? There it is. Thank God. Look here. I'm inside my bedroom closet. I'm going to keep the tape recorder running, and I'm hiding in here with my files. If something happens to me, and you find any tapes or files somehow, please, bring it to the investigator, Jimmy Malcolm of North Adams. That goes for this video footage as well.
Come on out, it's the police. It's the same face we saw at the dig site. It's the same face that flashed on screen during Tiffany Crisaldi's ultrasound. And, uh, it's currently ripping Arnold apart, all the while using the voices of its past victims. Whew, boy! Accessing GBS Properties, 101, WRAV, FM, Radio Station. Date of Broadcast, December 13, 1963. Segment, Announcement of the National Access Initiative. Beginning Playback. Our hacker from Episode 1 loads up a radio broadcast from the early 1960s, where we learn about the National Access Initiative, which was designed to give the American people easy access to information, as well as communication, right at their fingertips. Citizens around the nation would receive care packages which included televisions, telephones, alarm systems, and flashlights. The president at the time, Lyndon B. Johnson, partnered with who else? Simeodyne USA to help create these packages and distribute them across the U.S. But you see, there's one small caveat. Every product they sent out was bugged meaning both Simeodyne USA and the U.S. government has eyes and ears inside every home across the nation. Ah, uh, that sucks. That, that really blows. TBH. Don't care for it. Ah! <laughs> Okay, all right, uh, we're going to break down the top three reasons this fucking sucks. Uh, number one, uh, makes me uncomfortable. Number two, uh, yikes. Uh. This week, president of Simeodyne USA, Percival C. Rothwell, had a lot to say. The National Access Initiative represents a milestone in our nation's journey towards progress and inclusivity. Motherfucker looks like a Percival. Look at that. Jesus Christ. Dudes who look like that, they're not named, like, Derek. Perhaps most shocking of all, 29% of Americans don't even have a telephone in their home, meaning they're unable to call for aid or even just contact friends or family members. They are left disconnected. Kennedy didn't go for it. But you assured me he was available. Was that just one of your bullshit? Well, he's gonna fucking expose our whole plan for the NAI program. The meeting couldn't have gone worse. If that fucking dick thinks he's gonna expose Simeon, he's got another thing coming. But we're not the only ones he's pissed off lately. After rejecting Operation Northwoods, and then that executive order involving the Federal Reserve, there are a lot of snakes in the grass, but it's about time that Kennedy got bit. At Simeodyne USA, we're building the future. Simeodyne USA is here with you every step of the way. image flashes on screen which of uh, uh, number one makes me uncomfortable and number two a uh, good god jesus christ the johnson administration has stated that while they are going to begin launching this landmark program right away it will first be made available only in select areas 
as construction crews from coast to coast prepare to establish important infrastructure that will support the National Access Initiative program. We then fast forward to 1994 with footage from a Simeodyne device in the bedroom of a little girl where we see this. asks the figure if he's from the weird doctor's office she had to go to recently, which we can assume to be a Simeodyne facility, like the one mentioned in Tape 3. After she's attacked, for a moment, we see Katie hooked up to the Thought Form Manifesto. Hello, you've reached Alex Marsh and Tiffany Crisaldi. We're not able to get to the phone, so please leave a message after the tone and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Messages from the Dead begins different. We see a gloved individual walking around the woods, finding a dead rat. And what do you do with the dead rat you find in the spooky woods? You bring them home, I guess.
Next up, we see the other end of the missed phone call from the last tape. Hey, babe. I'm just checking in. Could you please give me a call as soon as you can? Don't worry about work, either. Please. You're way more important, okay? Okay. I love you. Bye. Um, after we lost the baby, um, I stayed home for almost a month. We both took it hard, but I was just really worried about Tiffany. She seemed to only be getting worse with time. She spent a lot of time by herself. When it came time for me to return to work, we decided I would call home every day during my lunch break just so we could talk and check in on each other. She always picked up the phone whenever I called. She knew it would worry me sick if she didn't pick up the phone. Alex Marsh calls to check in with his high school sweetheart during his lunch break. We learn that these phone calls are part of a new routine for the couple after the mysterious loss of their baby. But, as Alex explains to a police officer, Tiffany did not answer their scheduled calls. You know, just, I'm getting a bit worried, so please call me back, okay? Love you. The footage is briefly interrupted by a shot of a bunch of candles arranged around a triangle with a circle in the center, which is not so coincidentally the logo of Channel 13, home of Don Wright Tonight. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm gonna head home. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm kind of freaking out. I'll be there soon. I love you. We then hear the intake report for Tiffany by the Massachusetts medical examiner, Dr. Heinrich Albrecht. Dr. Heinrich Albrecht, Medical Examiner, Westfield, May 19th, 1987, 3.23 p.m. Intake report for Tiffany Elaine Marie Crisaldi, Caucasian female, age 28, 29, 26, 30, 27, 25. He states that although the paper reported her cause of death to be heartbreak, she's got a case of uh, a little bit of a little bit of black goo coming out of her face hole. Initial external evaluation reveals a resinous black substance adhered to the face, neck, and upper thoracic region. Samples have been obtained. Uh, additionally, the eyes are fully retracted. These observations are aside from any traditional indicators of struggle or violence as a cause of death. A rigor and lever mortis align with the estimated time of death. He also notes a strange carving found on her abdomen that apparently is quite fresh. So fresh, in fact, that the symbol had to have been carved into her after she died. Unusual finding on the abdomen, specifically below the sternum. Um, symbol of some sort has been carved into the flesh. Equally concerning is the absence of hemorrhaging in the surrounding tissues. Due in part to this, I have been able to ascertain that this symbol was carved into the skin post-mortem. In summary, while the exact cause of death is yet to be determined, it is the carving that requires the initiation of an immediate and in-depth investigation. This aspect of the case should be treated with utmost priority due to its unusual and unnerving nature. Private lock for case file 87-091-HA for my home archives. 
Back in his home, the doctor records his personal thoughts on the case. He mentions that his assistant Sarah heard the voice of a woman crying when Tiffany arrived. Eric, what sounded like a woman crying, coming from the direction of the cooler. I shrugged off her remark and let her leave early, telling her she was likely stressed or overtired, and I continued cleaning up on my own. I didn't dare to tell her that I heard it as well. Okay, Tiffany, we're recording now. Okay. So We then rewind about 22 years to a point where a young and very much alive six-year-old Tiffany Crisaldi is receiving therapy for her hallucinations. Okay, are you ready, Tiffany? I think so. Are you nervous? Yeah. Okay. I'll need you to follow my instructions, okay, Tiffany? As long as you do that, everything will be fine. Can you do that for me? Okay. Good. I'm going to play some sounds that will help you through this exercise. We hear the currently unnamed doctor slowly guide her through a hypnotherapy exercise. During the session, this doctor describes in great detail the interior of the young girl's home and urges her to imagine her bedroom and to imagine something that seemingly only exists in her mind. You are alone. I'm going to walk quietly to your bedroom now. You come to the stairs and begin to walk up. You hold on to the banister as you go, letting your hand slide up. Step. 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 You reach the second floor hallway. Everything is in its proper place. You are alone. Nobody else is here with you. You look to the right and you can see your bedroom door closed at the end of the hall. You walk into a room and that's when you can see something different that's never been there before. Tell me what you see. It's... It's a door next to my window. That's right, it's a door. What does the door look like, Tiffany? It looks black. It has weird marks on it. The wood looks weird. Walk to the door and open it. I'm scared. It doesn't matter if you're scared. You must open the door. He tells young Tiffany to open the door, which causes the music in the room to cease as she describes what lives beyond the door. It's a small room. Somebody's in there. No, Tiffany, you're alone. No, no, there's someone here. He's facing away from me. He's standing and tall. He's very tall. Tiffany, you are alone. Nobody else is there. Now tell me what else is in the room. There's a TV. The screen is all fuzzy. And the tall man is watching it. Tiffany, I want you to focus on removing the man from your mind. When I snap my fingers, he will be gone. You will be alone. The man's shaking. His body is cracking. Okay, Tiffany, I'm going to count down from five. When I snap my fingers, you will return to the real world. Five. You're feeling more awake He's now. turning around. Four. Everything around you is becoming He's amazing. looking at me. He sees me. Three, Tiffany. You can feel the chair you're sitting in again. Two. Everything around you fades to the blackness behind you. One. Full control of your body. Zero. We're awake, Tiffany. You're returning to reality now. A young Tiffany Crisaldi seems to have made contact with a thought form. A tall, cracked figure.
back to the freak in the woods, we see him bring his new rat friend home. Hold on, don't do that to rat friend! What ever do to you? Apparently, hiding messages inside of dead rats was a very real thing that the CIA did back when, uh, you know, sending a text just wouldn't cut it. The tape inside of Rat Friend is addressed to a black-gloved man, a man by the name of Jim Melgren, the same private investigator we read about in Tape 7, and the same private investigator that Arnold Rivers contacted in Tape 8. <laughs> I have some very important information for you pertaining to the events you have been investigating. We are also met with the same star logo that was carved into Tiffany's body, and an unnamed distorted voice attempting to give Jim some top secret information regarding simiodine, thought forms, and the numerous deaths around Mount Greylock. It's impressive you remained alive for this long. But then again, you've gone to great lengths in the past in order to survive, haven't you? I'm going to tell you a story, Jim. A story that you've been dying to hear. But first... next tape is Just Like Me, short and sweet, and opens with who I assume to be Jim Melgren, setting up a trap in his basement. Throughout the tape, we see the same creepy occult candles in the formation of the Channel 13 I logo. Jim sets a tape player on the floor of this room, and when he hits play, we hear a familiar sound. Although, it's an odd one. We hear the sound of Alex Marsh crying during his police interrogation video. And after a while, the video completely glitches out. And I think that means a couple of things. One. Jim is setting a trap for Tiffany's weird thought form zombie corpse. And two, since the tape is glitching out that much right after he activated his crying husband decoy, I think she's a lot closer than we think. But hey, what do I know? I'm just, uh, I'm just doing a little theorizing. So why not do a little theorizing? Our last tape of the night is another Simeodyne video cassette, 
which this time is intended for Charlotte Melgren, presumably the daughter of our humble investigator. So if that's not your name, click off, buddy. Unless you're subscribed, if you're subscribed, you can... <laughs>
just going to go flip the breaker. Uh, Ms. Morgan, we strongly advise against going outside or into the kennels, especially with the power outage. We can call out a police officer dispatched and well, they can make wait, sure it's wait, safe wait, wait, before wait, you... Wait, hold on. Is, is there any way we don't have to do that? I have to be up at 6, and the last time it took them over an hour to get here for nothing. Please. Uh, Ma'am. Like I said, this has happened a ton of times, and plus the dogs aren't even barking. If someone was in there, they'd be going crazy by now. Ma'am, I could get in a lot of trouble if anything happened, and I didn't call anyone. It's company policy. How about this? I'll keep you on the phone while I go, okay? I'll switch to my cordless and everything. If anything happens at all, you can call the police. Miss Milgren. I will even grab my flashlight. I, uh, well, uh, just uh, let me at least check tonight's footage to make sure everything looks okay mm. first, all right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Go for it. Okay. Let me see here. Troy reluctantly lets Charlotte walk into the kennels to flip the breaker back on. But first, he insists on checking the previous five security alerts from the past month that Charlotte was told were just false alarms. Huh. Um, okay, I'm getting an error. It's not letting me review it. Well, I, I can just head over really quick. Like, real quick. Well, there's no motion alert in tonight's log, so... Okay, just... Please be quick and safe. Thank you. Seriously, I'm going to go throw some clothes on and, um, you know, grab the cordless, okay? Yeah, all right. I'll look into the false alarms you mentioned and see if I can figure out what's going on with that. Okay. Be right back. Only problem is, is most of the footage is corrupted. I say most because we were able to view the alert from about a week ago. And we see. Okay, on the cordless. Got my flashlight. Still there? Um, yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, heading outside now and then going right across to the kennels, so just hang on another sec. Okay. A couple days later, the same creature is captured, noticing the camera, and giving us a little... So one of those. And after viewing that, Troy is naturally spooked, and urges Charlotte to leave the kennel and just wait for the cops to arrive. Which, of course, she does not do. On my way to the basement. But everything seems fine. I'm, I'm really not sure this is a good idea, Ms. Mogren. Listen, something's wrong with the recording as I'm seeing of your home. What do you, what do you mean, wrong? Honestly, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what I'm looking at here. It seems like the camera's glitched out or something, but the previous calls you've been getting, they, they weren't false alarms. Yeah, again, I'm not sure what's going on here, but uh, something's been stalking around your property for a while now. I, I'm not sure how the previous people who called you didn't notice. Okay, something like what, an animal, or...? No, no, well, I, I don't know, actually. I just... Listen, I, I just think you should go back to your house, okay? Please. Okay, okay, yeah, you, you win. Let me just make sure that the dogs are okay, and I'll head back over. They're just right here. <sighs> okay, thank you. I'm gonna try to look over tonight's footage again, just in case it's decided to work. Okay. Hi, babies. Hi, Mama. It's... Um... What's wrong? Um... I don't... know. You okay, you okay, buddy? Charlotte? What's going on? The dogs aren't moving. They're all just... standing... here. Well, it's late, so maybe they're just tired or something. Uh, but let's just get no, you back. Not it, but they're just and as she tries to deduce that one, Troy finally gets video footage from tonight to play, revealing the tall creature letting himself into the kennel. Oh my god, it's, it's like they're fucking dead, oh, but they're fuck. not. What the fuck? What? What? Miss Melgren, you need to get out of there and return to your house immediately. I'm sending your information to the police right now. Meaning, oh it's probably still in there. Okay, now! Fuck, fuck I'm leaving! What was that? Are you okay? Charlotte! Charlotte, are you okay? It, it just... You ripped my flashlight. Charlotte? You ripped my 
flash of God. It's God. It's God. Something. Something ripped it out of my hand. I can't. I can't see anything. Please. Please fucking help me. Please. Please. Something's in here. Wait. Okay, Charlotte. I've sent your information to the North Adams PD. Okay. Troy contacts the North Adams Police Department, trying to keep Charlotte calm as she waits for help to arrive. But then, she drops this gem. Okay, can you find your way out? I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. The front door is no longer there. Charlotte manages to make her way into another room of the kennel. Still unable to see anything, Troy instructs her to remain completely silent so that this creature cannot hear her. Breathe, Charlotte. Breathe. You need to try and stay as calm as you possibly can. Listen, if it's that dark, whatever is in there probably can't see you either, okay? So it's important that we stay very quiet until the police arrive. Very quiet. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Stay right where you are keep your back against the wall all right the officer's just down the road right now you're gonna be okay now now listen i'm gonna stop talking so we can be completely quiet but no i'm still here i'm not going anywhere until you're safe thank you thank you i'm sorry i'm so sorry i should have listened to you it's it's all okay we're gonna get you out of there now, no more talking. And as we hear it grow closer and closer, Charlotte sits in silence, as it sounds like the monster is coming face to face with her, unable to see her. test. This test is made up of five statements. You will check true or false beside the corresponding number for each statement in your workbook. The if tape then returns to the training segment, and this time we get some solid information on what exactly this tape's purpose is, asking us to answer true or false to the following statements. First, this tape is designed to change our brain's chemistry, forever altering it. Humans are all weak-willed and willing to betray everything and everyone if given the proper stimulus. Free will is an illusion. And this one... It's gotta take the cake. We all have our moral thoughts and desires, but it's critical to focus our energy on the positive aspects of ourselves so that we can be better people. The 
the darkest aspects of your mind are part of a larger psychological entity that resides deep within your unconscious. This shadow entity cannot be reasoned with. It cannot be ignored. You cannot subdue it, lock it away, or eliminate it. Even attempting any such thing has the opposite effect, only making it stronger, darker, and more dangerous. Our dark and immoral thoughts apparently exist in our minds as a shadow entity that, if denied, only makes it more powerful. Oh yeah, and, uh, and, and we're supposed to open the black door within our brain. Kind of like young Tiffany did back in tape 10. Statement number five. Opening the door to your shadow psyche and embracing your darkest urges as a part of yourself is the only way to live a fulfilling life. Testing complete. We then see a few visual and audio stimuli to help us complete our training. And again, some such visuals include some spooky faces, like this one, that I believe is Don Wright. Okay. Footage from within someone's home as they record an invisible figure opening the door to the bathroom they are hiding in. Alright. A thought form peering out of a containment unit, like we heard about in Tape 3. Oh shit. And footage of someone running through the endless tunnels within Mount Greylock. The training tape ends letting us know the name of the next thought form video. The Shadow. Communion and Assimilation. Assimilation, huh? I wonder, uh... I wonder what... I wonder what that all, uh, what that's all about. We then cut back to the Forever Friends dog cameras as a police officer has finally arrived on the scene, and we get to see the fate of Charlotte Melgren. Okay, we're seeing the basement. Los Adams Police. Anybody down here? Jesus, it's dark in here. The fuck was that? just stops it just ends and that's all the and that's all the videos in the series right now so there you have it Greylock every single video all in this video how, how, how long's a runtime on this one Jesus Christ I'm gonna have a big gray beard by the time I'm done editing this one Carter a fantastic series in my opinion that the further you go, the more it connects. You just gotta mix some things around. If I'm right, which... 
It's happened before. Huge props to everyone on the Greylock team and the creator, Rob Gavigan. Again, if you've liked what you've seen here today and you want to see some more of the things I cut out or didn't quite cover, uh, why don't you go ahead and click the link in the description to watch the original series. It's fucking pretty good. Tape 12 was uploaded about a month ago, so any day now we could have a part 13, which again is the spooky number. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked my breakdown of the series and my little timelining of events, if you like that, go ahead and drop a comment, drop a like, drop a sub. Let me know what you think. I hope you I hope you have sweet dreams. And remember to stay safe from thought forms. Just try not to try not to use your brain. I've been doing it for been doing it for almost 23 years now. So I'm good.